Welcome to Love and Abuse, the show about helping you identify poisonous communication and toxic behavior. You deserve to be treated with respect and kindness. That's why it's important that you learn to pinpoint manipulative and controlling behavior so that you keep your power and your sanity. I'm your host, Paul Coliani. Hey, welcome to another episode of Love and Abuse. I have a special episode today. Uh, it is on something that I read about, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago. It was a book called Influence by Robert Cialdini. And he talks about these six principles of influence and how we can become persuaded to do things that we wouldn't necessarily do if we weren't persuaded. We might, but we we wouldn't necessarily do it on our own without this influential persuasion, if you want to call it that, uh, in our lives. And I'm going to present these six principles of influence from his book, from his research, and tell you how it applies to a psychological or a psychologically abusive relationship. Whether you want to call it psychological abuse, verbal abuse, a manipulative relationship, or just a plain difficult relationship. These principles, I've noticed there's a correlation in how an emotionally or psychologically abusive relationship forms and why we get sucked in and feel so committed to something that is so toxic to us. So I'm going to go over these principles right now and tie them in into the behaviors of an emotionally abusive person. And I hope you find it interesting, or at least as interesting as I do, because once you know these, then you can avoid or at least do some preventative maintenance so that you don't get trapped into a relationship because you were influenced to get into that relationship. It's just an awareness. You want to open up your awareness to what is influencing you and what behaviors someone else is doing to influence you to make them, make you, I mean, uh, commit to them. And so, you know, there's a debate on whether anyone can make you do anything, but you can be influenced very easily. So let's go over these principles uh, by Robert Cialdini. And I remember the principles like this, R-S-A-C-C-C-L. I don't know if that's going to help you, but it helps me. R-S-A-C-C-C-L. I repeat that to myself, and then I remember which letter goes to which principle. First one is reciprocity. Reciprocity is when you do something for someone, and they feel either obligated or they're influenced into doing something for you as well, a favor for a favor. If I gave you a birthday card out of the blue, you're more likely to get me a birthday card or even a gift next year or when my birthday comes along. And so how does this apply to an emotionally or psychologically abusive relationship? It applies because the abusive person, if, you know, if this is a person that's going to be abusive in the relationship, what they're going to do is create a scenario and this is along the lines of um, gift bombing and love bombing, they're going to create a scenario where they're giving to you. They're, especially at the beginning of the relationship, they're very giving. They are uh, wonderfully generous. And so you feel not only uh, you're getting a lot of attention, um, but it's reciprocal. And how do you reciprocate? You might give back, probably, maybe not with gifts, I don't know, but with love. So when there's gift bombing and uh, compliment bombing and love bombing, you're likely to give back. You're you're likely to open your heart and want to connect with them more. So this all works in the principle, uh, into the principle of reciprocation. So that's the first one, R-S-A-C-C-C-L. First one is reciprocation. The second one is scarcity. With scarcity, the emotional abuser, the narcissistic person, the sociopath, the verbally abusive person, all all of these people that you might get into a relationship in or have been in a relationship with, 
the idea of scarcity comes into play when they are not fully or wholly available to you. And that can mean many things. They might not be fully emotionally connected to you at all times. And so what you do is you feel that's a little scarce. And so what that does is make you want that emotional connection more. That's one aspect of scarcity. And when you want that emotional connection, you're more likely to want to reach out back to them and find out where they are and what's going on. And another part of scarcity is you text them or you leave a message and they don't text you or call you back for hours or maybe the next day. And what this does, it, it creates, it creates the scarcity, but what it's like is like um, the sale that ends in 24 hours. It's part of the, the process of this resource is scarce. So you got to have it. And so if something ends in 24 hours and there's only two items left and you want that item, that scarcity mindset takes place, it kicks in, and you want it so bad that you're willing to wait at the store opening to get in and get it. It's like that um, Black Friday stuff. You want it so bad, you know it's scarce, you know there's only a limited amount, and so you do everything you can to get it. And that plays into the emotionally abusive relationship as well, is that scarcity starts to seep in and you're not sure if you're going to get it. So you reach out and try to get it more. And they know this. The emotionally abusive person knows this. If I don't give enough of myself to this other person, they're going to reach out to me. And if I keep that going, they'll always have this fear of not getting enough, fear of not getting love, fear of not getting attention, fear that they're going to lose the relationship. So they'll always be reaching out to me as, you know, I'm role playing the emotional abuser right now. They'll always reach out to me, keeping me in control. And this allows me to continue to control the relationship because I'm always presenting scarcity. So that's, that's number two, a principle. The third one is authority, R-S-A-C-C-C-L. Reciprocation, scarcity, authority. What is authority? I mean, look at any narcissist. They walk in the room and they know everything. That's the extreme example, but uh, authority in the sense that it seems like they know what they're doing. And we tend to follow people. You know, leaders tend to know what they're doing. We tend to follow people that know what they're, or seem to know what they're doing. And what that does for us is it makes us feel more comfortable and more secure that someone's leading the way. And so uh, this authority comes across and plays a role in the relationship because we feel more secure when we know that this person knows what they're doing. I got this handle. I got this covered. Uh, and it makes us feel good to be with them. Now, this doesn't work in every relationship. I think what ends up happening is that when you have the more dominant personality that comes across as authority, comes across as smart, that it is an attractive quality. And it depends on who you are and what you're attracted to. But typically what I found is that people that don't lead themselves as healthy or as well as they could or should sometimes or often get attracted to people that do seem to lead themselves well. And sometimes when you mix all these components of emotional abuse together and, and an influence as well, what you'll end up with is someone that doesn't have your best interest in mind. They have their best interest in mind and they're still going to lead themselves into what they want and they're going to drag you along with them, but it's not going to appear like they're dragging you. They make it look like you're dragging yourself. You're the one that's lagging behind. You're the one that needs to follow them, that needs to look to them for advice and support. So authority comes into play. Like I said, especially with a narcissist, uh, authority will come into play there. And you know, here's another thing is that a lot of very uh, independent, self-educated, strong people get into emotionally abusive relationships and feel like they can settle down into themselves. What I mean by that is 
you don't feel like you have to take charge anymore. Like somebody else is there to take charge. And it feels good to let go of the reins. It feels good to let go and let somebody else take control of things. Problem is when you have a controlling, manipulative person controlling things and you are letting that part of you go and not leading yourself in a healthy way, making decisions that are right for you, and you let somebody else do that, you start to diminish. And they want that. They want you to diminish. They want you to become more submissive, looking at them as the alpha. And so that's the authority part. The next part, RSA, CCCL, the next two C's are together, um, commitment and consistency. Commitment and consistency means when someone commits to you and they're consistent, you're more likely to be influenced by them. All of these can work in a good way, in an ethical way as well, because a good relationship can contain a lot of these components. Uh, maybe not so much scarcity, but yeah, scarcity as well. You miss someone and you know it's scarce and you can't wait for them to come back. So maybe all of these can work into a healthy relationship as well. But you need to know how they, how it's affecting you and how you may be diminishing yourself, not leading yourself in a healthy way. And so we look at commitment and consistency in an emotionally abusive person. How are they showing up as committing and consistent? Well, the first thing they do is, especially in the first few months of a relationship, is they are consistent. They're calling you. They want to be with you. They're, uh, whatever, giving gifts to you, love bombing you, and all these things that are very consistent, very uh, nonstop almost. And it feels great. I've never gotten so much attention in my life. It feels so good. Yet, uh, what they're doing is establishing a foundation of trust and, and connection, but it, it is scripted. They're following a script so that you follow along and think that that's how they're going to show up from this point on. And so they come at you with commitment and they're consistent and they seem like they want to keep this relationship going forever and ever. They may even talk about marriage and kids or whatever to make it look like I'm in this for the long run. And then that shifts into abusive once they understand or once they realize that you're in love with them or if it's not a romantic relationship, love to be around them. Whatever the relationship is, they build it in such a way that you adore them in a way. So uh, when it comes to commitment and consistency, when you look at how that shifts after a few months, it shifts into a commitment to um, continuing to be abusive and a consistency in that abusive way. And what I mean by that is the stuff we've already talked about. They become less accessible less available and they're consistent with that and they're also this is another thing that happens they show up in a way that when you need them and you don't show up or that they don't show up for you you need them badly and you're waiting for them to come back because your heart is aching then they finally show up and they show you love then you are reconnecting and reinvigorating your emotions. You're re-energizing your emotions for them. And so this surge of love and happiness and positivity fills your heart, fills the relationship. And now you believe that uh, there's a reconnection and everything is going to be good again. And this is where the cycle of love and abuse starts. You love and then you feel hurt. And then you love and then you feel hurt. And so the person doing this over and over again is, is very consistent doing it and they're committed. They, they are committed to you. I've seen this over and over again. The emotionally abusive person wants this relationship, but they want it their way, regardless of how you feel, regardless of how, uh, how they lie to you or manipulate you or control you, but they still want it. They, they are committed to this relationship. So this is how the commitment and consistency shifts from the first few months of all this wonderful stuff to the rest of the time when it's all dysfunctional and toxic. Let's go to the next one, the next C, R-S-A-C-C-C-L. I'm going to drill this into you. Uh, the next C, the only C uh, left, is 
consensus. Now, consensus is how does everyone else feel about this person or what is everyone else doing? Like in general consensus, uh, the example I think they use in the book is, I'm not sure if this is the exact example, someone falls down and hurts themselves and everyone's looking like, oh, I hope they're okay. And somebody might actually approach them. But let's just say that, I mean, you may have seen something like this. Something happens to someone and nobody does anything. The reason nobody does anything is because nobody else is doing anything. And sometimes you don't want to be the first one to, to step up and do it. Because the general consensus, it's called social proof as well. I am looking at the proof that everyone else is standing around. So this must be what we should be doing right now. And a good example in my life, a couple things have happened in my life. An older woman was walking into a Panera Bread and I was sitting with my friend Scott inside and I looked back and I saw her walk in and she stumbled and fell. And I immediately jumped up and went over to help. It was probably about 30 or 40 feet away and nobody else did. And that surprised me because there were several people that were close to that area, closer to her, but I seemed to be the only one that got up and did that. And I realized that was part of consensus. You know, the general consensus was, well, uh, that person didn't help. So I guess I won't need help or need to help. Uh, or that person was right next to her and didn't help. So he or she must know better. So I won't go over and see if that person needs help. That's consensus. The other thing that happened to me was uh, I was at a conference once and we were all standing outside the, the meeting room. And um, I think we were all waiting for the door to be unlocked. And so it was great because there were two doors, one over here, one over there. And somebody tried one door and it was locked. And they said, well, it must not be starting yet. You know, it was a couple minutes to nine. It's probably not starting yet. Nobody tried the other door. And one guy comes out from the hallway and asks, you know, what's going on? Is this, is it starting yet? And I think the general consensus was, uh, the doors aren't open yet. So apparently they're not starting. And he asked, well, did anybody try the doors? And the general consensus was again, uh, we tried the doors because I believed that person tried the door, the door, and that person believed that person tried the door and that person believed that person tried the door. And so on and on and on, we all had a, a general idea that we thought everyone did what we thought we would, they did. <laughs> so we waited for someone else to come along. And what he did was try the locked door. And then he tried the other door. And guess what? It was unlocked. And we all kind of said, oh, we could have been in there by now instead of being cold in this hallway. And we all went in. And that really hit me because I study this stuff. I understand how social proof or consensus works, yet I was still a part of it because I was influenced. We were all influenced. And how this applies to a narcissistic, emotionally abusive, a psychologically abusive relationship is that often, almost always, family and friends and relatives and well, family and relatives, and um, a lot of other people that know your partner, know that person that's being emotionally abusive toward you from a totally different side. They are all in consensus that that person is nice, that that person is charming, that that person couldn't possibly be hurting you or making you feel bad about yourself. There's no way that that person could do that stuff to you. So this is how consensus applies to the emotionally abusive relationship is that there's a general consensus that that person is a good person, is a good guy, is a good girl, is a good whatever. And that isolates you, makes you feel alone. And you're that older person tripping at the Panera Bread or wherever. And uh, let's just say that someone like me wasn't there and they didn't come to your aid because they didn't see what I saw that day. They thought you were okay. Now, this doesn't work when you do hurt yourself and you're screaming for help in this public place. Someone's going to come to your aid. But in the emotionally abusive relationship, you can often feel so alone, so isolated and tell people what's going on. But because of the general consensus toward that other person that he or she's okay, 
and they're not mean, they're not a bad person, you may not get someone to hear you. And that's a challenge. And that's why you have to be careful about getting sucked into a relationship like that and be aware of these principles of influence that are taking place all the time around you by everyone. Everyone uses these without knowing they use them. A lot of people. Uh, Emotionally abusive people inherently know how to do this. They may not call it the six principles of influence. They just know what works. And if they know what works, they're going to repeat that. And so that's why this was studied. Robert Cialdini's book called Influence, he talks about all of these principles in much greater detail. And it's worth reading into. It's very well written and it's a very good book. Highly recommend it. So let's get to the last one. RSA CCCL. Reciprocity. Scarcity. Authority. Commitment and consistency. Consensus. Also called social proof. And liking. So the last one, L, liking. And I'm going to also include love, liking or loving. So when someone is nice to you, you like them. When you like them, you're more likely to be influenced by them. And a good example of this is when you meet someone new, for example, you're working with them. When you work with someone, you get to know them. And if they are at all decent, you get to like them. You're more likely to end up dating someone that you know and like than you are some perfect stranger that asks for your phone number in the grocery store. Maybe you are, maybe not. I don't know. But most people are more likely to be with someone, be friends with someone, get in a romantic relationship with someone, with someone that they like. And in the difficult relationship, what ends up happening is that you end up loving this person you know, whatever depth of love that is, but because you love you, it's almost like you are committed to the love itself. You love the loving feeling. You love being loved and you want more love. And so this love is a huge influence in your behavior. And when you get love or what love they pretend they're giving you, when they give you what they call love and it feels like love to you, What ends up happening is that you are again sucked into their influence, their charm, their ways of keeping you on board. Those breadcrumbs that keep you following them, that keep you with them. And so the liking or the loving that takes place when you get to know someone well and you like the good parts of them in the psychologically abusive relationship the good parts are what you tend to focus on. And the tough parts, the toxic parts, are the ones you hope don't happen again, so you'll become dismissive about them. And a good example of this is you're more likely to like someone or love someone that does nice things for you. It kind of plays into reciprocity. You're more likely to give back. You're more likely to commit. You're more likely to want a relationship with someone that you like and especially love. And someone that is uh, doesn't have your best interest in mind but wants to control you by causing you to like them or love them is going to have more control and more and be able to manipulate you more. And when you're in that space, you become vulnerable to their charms, to their behavior. And they take advantage of that vulnerability and make you do things that you normally wouldn't do in a relationship. And what I mean by that is you probably normally wouldn't be with someone that continually hurt you, but they disguise the hurt as love. And you feel loved by someone that's hurting you and you stay in the relationship because you keep seeking that love. You want to see what you saw in the beginning and you can't often find it again. Once it goes down this road, you can't find it again until They realize they're hurting you and they're empathetic enough to change. They're empathetic enough to feel bad that they're hurting you. When they feel bad that they're hurting you, then you have a chance that the relationship can heal, can progress, that it can get better. But until they're empathetic, until they get into that space where they think to themselves, 
I feel so bad for hurting that person. I better do something. I better work on myself. I better heal myself. Until you see that, you never see change. Empathy has to come. It has to be in there in order for you to see change. So if you're in this type of relationship where someone else is maybe inadvertently using the principles of influence to get you into the relationship and keep you in the relationship, your conscientiousness of these principles is going to help you avoid getting in your own way. And what I mean by that is we become so enmeshed in a relationship sometimes that we get in our own way and don't see the toxic behavior that's right in front of us, that's right under our nose. And if you don't see that and you don't know why you feel the way you do, then you're more likely to continue down a toxic path. And that will continue to hollow you out and create a shell of your former self. And I don't want you to be there and I know you don't want to be there. So if you're interested in the psychology behind all of this, get Robert Cialdini's book called Influence. And I I think I have it listed. I do. I, I think I have it listed at theoverwhelmedbrain.com under deeper learning. Um, if you don't get it there, you can get any bookstore or Amazon or wherever you find books. But it's a good book. I hope you got value from this episode today. Please share this with others that might benefit. Love and Abuse is the official podcast of The Mean Workbook, an assessment and healing guide for difficult relationships. If you want to pinpoint the exact behaviors causing the difficulties in your relationship, including identifying all the signs of possible emotional abuse or psychological abuse or verbal abuse, head over to loveandabuse.com. This show exists to remind you that you are not alone and you're not going crazy. You deserve to be treated with respect and kindness. You deserve honesty and sincerity. You deserve to be treated as worthy and significant because you are. Thanks for joining me today. We'll talk again soon. Mm -hmm.